Okay, you're good to go. Is the mic working? Okay, good. We're in good shape. Okay, Darwin isn't demolished. Uh, one thing is important to know, and that is among the scientific establishment, Darwinism has pretty well taken over. The recent survey done of the beliefs of evolutionists, major evolutionists, find that 98% are atheists. They no longer believe in God. And the reason why is because, as often been stated, evolution is the doorway to atheism. And I picked that up when I worked for Madeleine Murray O'Hare. She uh, was one of the most famous atheists in the United States for many years. And uh, she, when I was doing articles for her, that's my background is in the atheist world, she said, I asked her, why there's so many articles in our magazines that are about atheism? Why there's so many articles about evolution? She said, well, very simply because evolution is the doorway to atheism. Very simply. Okay, a few scriptures. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness <laughs> was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen and understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power. My throat is giving me a hard time. It doesn't, Satan doesn't want me to give this talk. So, we'll see if we can be follow him. Through faith, we understand that the world were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, what is seen is not made of what was visible. So what is seen was made from what is invisible. In Isaiah 45, 12, I made the earth and created man upon it. And even my hands have stretched out the heavens and their host I have commanded. So again, there are many, many scriptures. There's about 50 scriptures that talk about God is the creator. Genesis 5.1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female, he created them in the beginning. So research proves that evolution is false. Uh, or true, but it's going the wrong way. So evolution, as you normally think of evolution, is false. Let me define evolution. There are a lot of people who define it in various ways, like a change in the frequency of genes, and that's not what I'm looking at. Evolution is from molecules to man, and that is actually the title of a well-known biology book. Evolution from molecules to man. So we begin as molecules, through natural selection, we became man and woman. <laughs> the problem, of course, is not survival of the fittest. That's obvious. The more fit, more likely to survive, that fits. The problem is the arrival of the fittest. And the primary basis of macroevolution or evolution is we have to have genetic variations. Genetic variations are a result of the change in DNA, the code that makes our bodies. The DNA makes our phenotype, our body, and change is required. And that change is mutations. Mutations, though, are all too often, far too often, harmful. And I'm aware of that because when I was doing research, the medical college, I researched cancer. And cancer is a result of mutations. So we know a lot about mutations. We've studied them for years because to understand cancer, we must understand <coughs> mutations. Theodosius Zabzanski, another well-known scientist, said, mutation is the only source of the raw materials and hence of evolution. So the focus in this presentation is on mutations because without mutations, we have no evolution, very simply. 
And there's a book I covered that. This is called The Three Pillars of Evolution Demolished, which I'll be doing a presentation later. And the three pillars are one, mutations, two, natural selection, and three, abiogenesis, the origin of life. And that's what that book's about. And this is another topic which is of interest. Why did God create viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens? One of the major reasons people lose the faith is because if there's a good God, why would God create all of these germs? And I cover that in the presentation. And the book covers that as well. And it may surprise you to know that without viruses, you would not be alive. So thank God, one of my talks I give, thank God for viruses. When you pray, oh Lord, thank you for viruses. <laughs> now some are bad. Some bacteria are bad. But the same thing is true with bacteria. We're more aware of the necessity of bacteria. And it may surprise you that the discovery of x-rays which cause mutations was so great that it got a Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize, the most honorific prize in science. And this article summarizes that. New discovery speeds up evolution. In other words, if you increase the mutation rate, like spending your time in an x-ray machine, it will improve your offspring, especially because your offspring will, will be mutated, and that is a way of improving, you're probably saying, wait a minute, <laughs> are you okay? What's in this bottle? <laughs> I mean, what are you talking about? Well, that's true. What, it really is foolish to believe that we can, we can improve you, your offspring, especially by causing mutations. But yeah, that is really what's believed. Okay, Herman Miller in his discovery of x-rays increasing the mutation rate in living organisms by as much as 100 times, said it could speed up evolution. That's what his words. His experiments, what he did was... Get some water here to get Satan out of my throat. <laughs> his experiments involved putting fruit flies in a Petri dish, putting that in an x-ray tube, turning it on, and exposing the fruit flies to x-ray radiation, and he found... It increased the mutation rate enormously. But what did he find? He found fruit flies with no wings, with three wings, with no eyes, with blue eyes, with all kinds of distortions. He never found a fruit fly that was better. They were always worse. You think he would realize that you're not going to improve the body by exposing your body to mutations. It's not going to work. And the excitement was so great that he got the Nobel Prize, quote, for the discovery of the production of mutations by means of X-radiation. So that's what they're saying. And, and I'm glad you laughed when I, a few minutes ago, you're not going to improve your body by exposing it to radiation. I mean, we all know that. When you go to your dentist, they do, they do X-rays of your teeth and they put a lead shield on you. And the, 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 the X-ray tech leaves. Right? I mean, we know that that's a problem. And in my working for the medical school, I worked with radiation. We had the little badges you wear. If we got too much radiation, they put it, us in another department. You need to keep your radiation level down. But yet they claim that is the source of variation. Other sources, people say, yeah, okay, but what about sexual reproduction? There's nothing new. Right? You have mom, you have dad, you have children. And they got all their genes, every one of them, from mom or dad. That's it. End of story. You know that. And the primary changes of rearrangement, again, there's nothing new. There are means of rearrangement called crossing over and transposition. But there's nothing new. Richard Dawkins, he tried to explain evolution. He's a well-known evolutionist. And this is what he did. He says, look, we'll get a typewriter or a computer. We'll type out a bunch of letters at random. Then we'll have a program which saves the letters 
to get what we want, which is me thinks it is like a weasel. And so we go through the steps here, and you'll notice changes to an M, and that's saved. Change to an E, and that's saved. Change to a T, and that's saved. So we end up, after 44 changes, we end up with me thinks it is like a weasel. But obviously, what's going on here? This is produced by an intelligent designer who programs the computer to get the final product. It really doesn't help us understand how evolution works. But that's the illustration he uses. And Richard Dawkins, by the way, is by far one of the most famous evolutionists and atheists that's ever lived. Uh, when he writes a book, he sells 10,000 copies before it's even printed. He's very, very widely popular. I, by the way, I had a chance to debate him a few years ago in Indianapolis, and I was kind of frigid about it, but thought, hey, I can do it. And he wanted my resume. So I sent my resume to him, and he emailed the, creation, the, the atheist group sorry, in Indianapolis and said, I'm not debating Bergman. So I was disappointed, because I know if I debated him, we probably would have had 2,000 people in attendance. So I'd love to debate an evolutionist, but they all turned me down. We haven't been able to do that at all. So the problems. Number one, it assumes mutations are random. And we know from researching cancer, they're not. Certain mutations are far more common than others. In fact, when you get cancer, what they do is they try to find out which mutation caused your cancer, and they treat your cancer according to that mutation. That's targeted cancer treatment. Because we know in certain cancers, certain mutations are very common. In breast cancer, for example, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are very common. We know in many cancers, P53 is common. And we know that mutations in that gene are going to cause a problem. So we try to find what's going on. OK, are mutations random? No. And if this may, some of you may be flummoxed with this discussion, but I'll only go through three or four slides, so just hang on. This is how you produce serine. Three amino acids, T, C, and T, thymine, cytosine, and thymine. And there are six ways of producing serine. All of these combinations produce serine. So 9.4 by random of these changes are going to produce serine because all of these produce serine. Arginine, same thing. Down here we get aspartic acid, only two ways of producing aspartic acid. And so by random, these are going to be uncommon. And then methionine, only one way, and tryptophan as well, only one way, and therefore those will be about 1.6. So what's going to happen if, indeed, mutations occur? You're going to get more of these, more of these, but less of these. OK? And that's important to understand cancer. OK, so the mutation from one base to another also is not equal. Conversion to thymine. So G to T, C to T, A to T, these are mutations. This is what they cause. They cause conversions. And this right here, 58% are to thymine. So what are you going to get? A lot of thymines. So when you evaluate someone for cancer, you're probably going to get these conversions, and you're going to end up with a lot of thymine. Conversion to guanine, only 14%. Cytosine, 23%. Adenine, only 5%. So they're not random. You'll get conversion to one area. And conversion to thymine are 10 times more common than to adenine. So if we plug that in to Dawkins' comparison, what are we going to get? We will never get this. We'll get lots of T's. It deteriorates. So even with Dawkins' <laughs> idea, it doesn't work. Hotspots, another important factor. Hotspots are very common. And you look for this in cancer. 
think I got an example. Here you go. This is too big for some reason. It's, I don't know why that's so large now. Well, anyways, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with, in the gene, and this is E. coli, in the genome, you're going to end up with almost all the mutations occurring in one hot spot. Almost all. And rarely occurring in other places. And that's exactly what you look for in cancer. When you have a cancer patient, you look for the hot spot, and you see mutations have occurred there. And that happens to be here, but for some reason that dry diagram is way too large. One study, only two mutations counted for 94% of all the mutations out of the 319 that occurred. Big problem. So we look at that, and what are we going to find? There's a hot spot, and we're going to end up with changes, but we'll never get the goal. Moving on. So when we add this all together, again, it's moved around a little bit. We're never going to get the goal. So using Dawkins' example, it's not going to work at all. Polarity is also important. The reason amino acids produce proteins is because it has the right polarity, and the protein will fold and produce the right structure you need to survive. Okay, And therefore, the key is a polarity. The polarity has to match to cause the amino acid chain to fold so that you get the protein that you need. And these are some of the polarities, families. And therefore, these are nonpolar, uncharged. So these are space fillers. These are polar uncharged, borderline polar, nonpolar, polar, polar, positive polar, polar, negatively polar. So these amino acids are critical in getting the system to fold properly. And so what are you going to get when you have mutation? It's going to mess this up. It's not going to give you what you need to produce a protein that works. Now, our beneficial, now we get off that hard stuff, and this should be fun to go through the rest of it. Our beneficial mutation is common. I did a literature search and found a few examples. Total mutations, these are two sources of literature, and I found a half a million total mutations. Beneficial were 186. So all of them, except 186, were either neutral or negative. Percentage total that was useful was 0.04%. And that's out of 18 million records searched. Okay? Now, I'll give you some examples of beneficial mutations. One well known example is seedless fruit. Now, that's beneficial for you and I because we don't have to spit out seeds. It's not beneficial for the orange, it's dead. No more offspring, can't produce any more oranges. So it's good for you, but lethal for the genetic line of the orange. So yet they call that a beneficial mutation. Well, beneficial in certain situations. Another example is Belgian blue cattle. That was valuable to beef farmers, 20 to 30% more muscle. And that sounds really good. More muscle, it was tender. Low in fat, ideal, it seems. Well, not so much. There's the cow. The Arnold Schwarzenegger of the cow world. And really what's happened is, is that the gene which stops muscle production is broke. And so muscle production goes way beyond what it should because it's broken. And as a result, we get the Arnold Schwarzenegger of cows. So what causes that is actually nothing more than damage to the cow. And as a result of that damage, we get all kinds of problems. Side effects include a reduction of fertility. It produces a benefit if you want to look at big brawny cows, but that's about it. In fact, we now know it's a deletion of an 11 base pair coding region. It's lost. It's deleted. It's lost. Doesn't work anymore. Moving on. 
Seth Wright, this is the most famous example. And the reason this is famous is because, guess what? It was produced by accident, they thought. And Charles Darwin mentioned it in his books. And basically, they had short legs, these sheep. They could not jump high fences. So you'd save money in sheep herding because you didn't have to have high fences. You keep all your sheep in a certain area. And Darwin thought, exciting. Finally, we found a beneficial mutation, he thought. And there they are. The middle picture right here is the Ancon sheep. And they were very excited when they discovered that. Darwin was especially. The problem is, though, what they have is a disease called achondroplasia. And they were diseased. And they didn't last, they didn't survive too well because they were diseased. And we have many examples. That's a normal sheep, you can see in the picture here. That's a normal sheep. They tried to save the breed, but it really wasn't a breed, it was a disease. And there is a chondroplasia in humans. There you go. And as a result of a chondroplasia, well, this guy's got a good job as an actor, but it's not normal what he has. How they deal with it is they break the legs, they pull them out, the bone grows in between the space, they break them again, they pull the legs out, and the bone grows between those spaces. That doesn't sound very pleasant. But, or you can just get a job as an actor like this guy did and not have to go through that, which is smart. I presented this at Ohio State University a few years ago, and I had several people, one professor there who said, you've got to be wrong. You have to be wrong. I said, well, find an example. I waited and waited, and then a couple months later, I got this example. This man has six fingers. And as you can see, there's the x-ray. This guy is really good climbing trees. I mean, he can beat a squirrel <laughs> up the tree. He was really talented, no question. And then I did some looking into this example. And uh, I found not many people had nice five, six fingers, but had the, <laughs> a mess like this guy or like these people. It was a mess. Most of the time, what they have to do is they have to remove one of the fingers or several of the fingers most of the time. And that's what they do. So is that beneficial? The vast majority of cases, it's not. Here was a baby born with an extra arm. Now that would be useful. I noticed a couple of people in here have mothers carrying their babies around. But wouldn't that be nice to have three hands, three arms? You could... Hold the baby with one, and the other two you could use to make supper. <laughs> that would really be useful. Unfortunately, neither one is functional, and they had to remove both arms. So it was not, in this case, at all beneficial. Sheep there, born with extra feet. And that was beneficial for the farmer, because he charged money to people to come in and Gog is his sheep. Wasn't beneficial for the sheep. The sheep couldn't even walk. Here's a baby that had two faces. Obviously not beneficial. Here's a, <laughs> a turtle that had two heads. Obviously not beneficial. Here again, we can see another deformity. This man has a condition called Hertzuism. He's Hertzu. And, well, I don't know. I understand he has a hard time finding a date. A date. A, a, sorry, a date. Another. Another example. Another example. Where a lot of these came from is the Soviets, after they invented the atomic bomb, wanted to know whether or not mutations cause harm. So they had pregnant women lined up, had a look at the explosion of an atomic bomb, and then they went home, just stand here and look at it. They were all pregnant. They went home, and they ended up with birth of lots of mutant babies. And they 
were looking for some positive changes. None were positive. Most were born dead, and this is a good example, tragically. And so the Soviets learned a long time ago that mutations are not beneficial. And a couple more examples. Obviously, these were both born dead. A couple more examples. Now, what about the most famous example is bacteria. We have mutations, and bacteria then are immune from, in this case, streptomycin. They're no longer affected by streptomycin. What happens? Streptomycin normally fits into a receptor area here. Mutation, right here, changes that area, and then the streptomycin cannot fit in there like this. It cannot fit in, therefore you are resistant, the bacteria, the ribosome in the bacteria, is resistant to streptomycin, and therefore streptomycin doesn't kill the bacteria. But is this evolving? Is this better? No, it's damaged. And as you may expect, this damaged bacteria, even though it's resistant to streptomycin, this damaged bacteria doesn't work as well. It's, it cannot compete with normal bacteria because it can no longer be adjusted, which is what this active site is for. And so, yeah, it's beneficial for a short period of time for the bacteria, but not for the patient in the long run. Another example, here you have a micro, macrophage, and this is a receptor, and this right here is HIV. And for HIV to get into the virus, it has to have two keys. One key that fits this guy, CD4 receptor, another key that fits this guy, a CCR5 receptor, and it cannot get in the cell unless it has both keys. That's why HIV only can get into certain cells. It may surprise you to know, but that viruses are designed to get in your cells. It's what they do. But they can't get in unless they've got the right equipment. It's like if you leave your something at home and you ask me to go get it, well, I, if you have two locks, I have to have both keys. I can't get in your house until I have both keys. Now here you can see the CCR5 is defective. It doesn't work, and as a result, HIV can't bind, and as a result, a person with this damage is immune, and he does not get AIDS. He's not going to get AIDS. Yeah, that's good for him, but as you may imagine, this is damaged, and in the long run, it is not helpful for his health. He has a number of health problems. So True, you don't have to worry about HIV, but he has other worries. And so the non-functional CCR5 receptor, which is what we looked at, is less functional, it's part of the immune system, you're more likely to develop diseases like liver cancer because it's broken. So you have, you have an advantage in one small area, but many areas you don't. So if we look at the frequency of beneficial mutations, about 99.99% are either harmful lethal or near neutral. Near neutral means they don't cause a problem at once, but they add up. It's like a car. You know, brakes don't work quite as well as it should, and other things don't work, and it adds up, and you end up with a clunker. Or the best example is my aunt, who only went to the hospital to have her son, Terry, and when she was in her early 90s, she went to the hospital and died. I asked the doctor, what did she die of? And the doctor said, well, she didn't die of anything. Well, wait a minute. Come on, she's dead. She died of something. So he, he said, well, OK, Bergman, sit down. This is how it works. When you're 90, the liver doesn't work as well. Kidneys don't work as well. The brain doesn't work as well. The arteries don't work as well. Nothing works as well. And the accumulation of all these non-lethal events added up until finally her heart stopped and she died. So what did she die of? All of these things. The 
last step was myocardial infarction or heart failed, and so you write on the death certificate, heart failure. You're not going to write, well, kidney weren't working quite right, and the stomach wasn't working quite right, and she had some atherosclerosis, and she had... You're not going to write all that down. There's not any room. She just write down myocardial infarction. Write it down, end of story, you move on. So in many ways, that's what is going on here. And we know that these mutations, which are near neutral, add up, and that causes aging. So when you get older, I know most of you don't have this to worry about, but when you get older, hearing doesn't work as well, eyesight doesn't work as well, nothing works as well. Although you keep active and keep, keep your health up and go to church and spend some good time with some good friends, help you forget your troubles, and you can live to be pretty old. If you don't take care of yourself, what happens? You die much younger. Okay, the number of mutations Darwinism requires, thousands, thousands of mutations. And these have to be beneficial, but they're not. Okay, Shermer estimated trillions of distinct modifications are required to evolve humans alone. All beneficial, or most. And the problem is, fine, 99.99% are not beneficial. You'll never get evolution. Beneficial mutations are very rare. As a result, we end up with de-evolution. Near neutral, a problem they're not selected against. Your kidneys don't work as well as they should. It's not going to kill you. But it adds up with other problems, which does cause aging and results in less effective sight, smell, hearing, skin, stomach, intestines, kidneys, and on down the line. And natural selection in the cell. The cell has this mechanism, like P53. What happens is, is when the cell is damaged, P53, it sounds like P53 is a person. In some ways, it is. P53 checks the cell, makes sure everything's working right. If everything's working right, P53 says, you can now divide. No problem. If things are not working right, the cell then is repaired. P53 initiates a repair system. It's repaired. And then when it's repaired, the cell divides. And of course, we're cancer free at this point. If P53, though, is broken and damage occurs in the cell, then it's not repaired and you end up with damaged cells, i.e., cancer. And that's why in over half of all cancers, P53 is involved. Now, what if the cell is damaged too much? If P53 is working, it causes apoptosis. It causes the cell to self-destruct. It self-destructs the cell. P53 says we can't fix it. Too much damage destroys the cell. What if P53 is not working? The cell is not destroyed, and as a result, you get accumulation of damaged cells, and that is cancer. That's what causes cancer. And I work with that every day. We know a lot about this, what's going on, and it's clearly evident what happens. And so I think maybe if I would have asked at the medical school, gee, fellows, is there a Beneficial mutation in sight, they would probably look at me and say, what are you drinking? <laughs> What's your problem? Beneficial mutations don't exist in the real world, at least in the Department of Experimental Pathology where I was working. And yet evolutionists often, if you look at the literature, often they say, well, how did we go from here to here? Mutations. Mutations is the key to evolution. Okay, found in mutations, I can mention what that is briefly. Found in mutations is where, like sickle cell anemia, found in mutations are where somebody gets sickle cell anemia and that's passed on and becomes widespread. You go back to Adam and Eve, how many mutations did they have? Zero. They had none. As time goes on, what happens? 
the mutational load increases with each generation until today we have all kinds of mutations which cause problems. They accumulate. And that's widely known. Uh, many of my colleagues did not believe in Adam and Eve, but they clearly understood the fact that the mutational load in humans is increasing with each generation. We knew that because that's what we were doing as research, to find out what mutations are causing a problem and to fix it. So we're aware of that in medicine. That's what medicine do. We look at diseases that are up and coming and try to, try to respond to them, try to fix them. And uh, it's called founder mutation. And there are many examples of hemochromatosis is one. Uh, Huntington's Korea, I think, is probably the best example, Huntington's disease. We know exactly the person who first had that mutation and passed it on, Huntington's disease. And we now have found all the people who have Huntington's disease, which is a horrible disease, in this country are related to that original case. And then they found a whole bunch of people in South America had Huntington's disease. What's going on? What happened? Well, they went there and they studied and guess what they found? One of the persons who moved into that village is related to the founder line of Huntington's disease. And that person gave it to the people in that village in South America. So all of the people who had that disease were related to the person that originally had the mutation. And uh, pleiotropy, I could mention that quickly. What that is, is that many genes affect many traits. So if you have a mutation which improves something, then probably other things will be worse. So that's a problem for evolution. The complexities, this is the chart we were working on of the gene, gene influence, because one gene influences other genes, and this is the chart we're working on. And it probably looks like a blur to you. So there I will look at a small section of it. This is defructose. There's fructokinase, ATP. There's ADP. You can see all the relationships here, and this is just a small part of that whole, chi that whole chart. And that's why so many diseases affect so many things. Interactome. We know this gene right here affects all of these genes and all of those genes. And this is not complete, by the way. They're still working on that. When we're done, it's a mess because so many genes affect hundreds of other genes. And therefore, if this gene has a mutation, things improve in one area but mess up everything else. And that's why virtually all mutations in the end are harmful. Another example, this is a cell, and these cells are receptors. And when these set receptors are stimulated, all of these controls make sure the right message gets inside of the cell. It gets complex. The classical view was protein coding gene was here, starts here, ends here, all done. Now we realize that this gene is here and here, and inside of this gene is another gene. And right next to it is another gene. And right next to it here and overlapping is another gene. And inside of that gene is another gene. So if this gene is damaged, this guy, this guy, and this guy are all going to be damaged. So we have a cascade which causes a problem. And a uh, couple, well here, isoforms. We have one gene, one gene, and it's spliced in 95 different ways. And that one gene can produce 38,000 different genes. One gene can produce 38,000 genes. So you can see how mutations would never improve things. They will, at best, make things worse. Complexity problem. As you study the Bible, the, well, actually the Bible too, <laughs> As you study the body and the Bible, it gets more complex every time you study it. Just the other day, somebody was telling me her class was reading the Bible, and she mentioned, gee, I've read this scripture many times before, but I never noticed this comment on this scripture. It's a whole new, a whole new 
light for me. So there's a lot in the scriptures we miss when we restudy them, we notice there are things there we miss. And uh, this is the assembly of a uh, system of bacteria, bacteria flagella. All of these parts are necessary for it to work. And that's a whole presentation I'll do later. Uh, one scientist said, due to contamination of the genome by very slightly deleterious mutations, why have we not died a hundred times over? When you study, when I worked with nurses, and you study the body, the problem is many nurses end up with feeling they have the disease that they study. Anybody study nursing in here? I see a number of you are shaking your heads that say, yep, that's what happens. And so that is one problem. Age in the best example, we covered that conclusions. Although other mechanisms are proposed at its core, macroevolution, or from the goo to you by way of the zoo, is produced by new information, evolutionists claim, produced by mutations. Mutations cannot provide the source of genetic variation. And so therefore, mutations fail Therefore, evolution is not true. It can't be true. It's been clearly proven wrong. And if you deny that, maybe you should drink more of this. <laughs> it's just a problem. OK, any, I guess we have some questions now we can have. OK, if you have any question. Put up your hand, and I'll bring the mic uh, around. Yeah. Yeah. So, Doctor, what's your um, what's your opinion at this point with MR mRNA? Well, mRNA and how, is simply and how, it's, and how it's damaged the cell. Well, mRNA. I'll explain what mRNA is. RNA is produced. There are different types of RNA. There's tRNA, mRNA. mRNA is called messenger RNA. And what messenger RNA does is carry the code from the genes to the body to convert amino acid set into amino acid chains. And so every, every DNA produced, if it doesn't produce tRNA, or other RNAs, it produces mRNA. So mRNA is just a major, major basic part of the cell. Well, what the vaccine is trying to do is, instead of letting the gene produce mRNA, it just wants to produce mRNA directly, bypassing the gene. And that's tricky because, again, it's very complex. And a lot of people feel that we way too prematurely assume certain things about mRNA that may not have been true. So that's the problem. We're bypassing a step. Well, one thing, of course, to realize this is not the, you know, the natural mRNA. It's a synthetic mRNA. Yeah. In other words, it's a, it's a fake. Yeah. It's a fake one. Well, and one of the things they said was is, um, that the COVID would get worse as it mutated, and yet it seems to have gotten milder. Yeah. Many diseases, many do become worse, but they also become better because in time what happens is is that the strong in this case <coughs> virus kills off its host and therefore it dies the weaker ones survive because they can survive in you and you can spread them and so therefore in many ways what happens is is that we have selection which per, which selects for weaker strains and therefore, they become less problematic. And of course, then our body should become immune as a result. Most people who died from COVID already had pre-existing conditions that were often pretty serious. So not many young people, very rare. I think a small number they've estimated that were young. This is why I've often thought it's irresponsible to give children or healthy young people the vaccine. I mean, what's the point? It just causes problems. Older, vulnerable people, it's a different story. OK, other questions out there? I see one hand there. Lift your hand if you have a, a question. 
I try hard to put this into my words, but I'm just wondering, based on the mutations, the idea of the study of mutations and how it relates to God's design of reproduction, whereas he says in the Bible it's a blessing, it sounds kind of like if you said, oh, these people shouldn't get together and reproduce because they have this genetic disorder. I know we're all flawed, but... Um, and I believe the Bible's true. I'm just trying to put that together in my mind. How would I refute that statement if someone came to me and said, it sounds like... I cover that in detail in here. Okay. Yeah. Mutations are, I, as a result of the fall, the mutations rate has increased. I, once we're perfect, mutations can, and they are almost always repaired now. In fact, the problem with cancer is not so much the mutations. The problem with cancer is the mutations are not repaired properly. And so all of you right now have cancer genes. All of you have cancer right now. And your body can deal with it. And so therefore, it doesn't evolve into cancer disease because your body can find that problem and deal with it. One of the most successful ways of treating cancer, I think it's the main way, I've talked about this for a long time, is let the immune system do it. When a cell becomes cancerous, it changes, the immune system will deal with it. And therefore, if you have a strong immune system, it will take care of the cancer cells. A lot of the problem is people develop cancer because they don't have a strong immune system. And that's why they end up developing cancer. And lack of proper health for a lot of reasons. One reason is, is we know certain needs have to be fulfilled. And the best expression is, use it or lose it. People who are active physically, mentally, spiritually live longer, period. Men who are married live like six years longer, period, because they're married. <laughs> okay. So take, take care of your spouse and you will live longer. And we know why that's true. And we know, and women the same, but they don't live, they live it doesn't add as many years to a woman's life as it does a man's. The Bible says very clearly, in the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he said, it is not good that you be alone. We should be married. And uh, now I know a lot of you disagree with me. My wife disagrees with me. But I think, <laughs> she does, I think getting married young is one solution. Many cultures, the girls marry, they think, they think Mary was 14 when she had Jesus, okay? And they think Joseph was 28. I don't know if that, that's true, but that's, you can look that up. And, uh, but that's what historians feel. And the problem is, as Paul made very clear, you marry or you burn. And we have young people, their hormones are raging, they go to college, they spend a lot of time with beautiful young girls, what's going to happen? You know, you know. And uh, couples who are very perceptive realize that. And now you're aware, of course, that young marriages tend to fail, but there are good reasons why. Immaturity is one reason, and they can't support a spouse is another reason. And so in the olden days, it was not a problem because when a couple married, where did they move? With her parents or with his parents? When she had a baby, scary. Who helped take care of it? Mom, what do I do? He's screaming. I can't stop. What's going on? Honey, just I'll be there in a minute. You scream just like that when you were that age. Don't worry about it. I'm coming up. I'll take care of it. When the poor woman gets tired of being at home all day and she wants to go out and do something, she calls up mom, who's in the first floor, says, Mom, I got to get out of the house. It's driving me crazy. Honey, don't worry. I'll be up there in five minutes. It's a pleasure to take care of my grandkids. You go and have a good time. Go, go shopping or whatever, and I'll take care of the kids, and she can go. She can, she's free. So in many ways, the way we lived when a lot of us were younger is better. No wonder we have so many problems because of the way we live. No, I'm okay. sorry, that's my okay. sermon okay. for the day. Questions back on the topic of uh, evolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, evolution has been demolished, right? So uh, let's, yeah, the question's back there. But while I'm walking there, a question for you is, you know, we know all this about the mutations. They're bad. There are no, almost no good mutations. And the scientists who, are, who believe in evolution know that. So why do they continue to believe that? Yeah, that's a good question because they really, really f fiercely believe in evolution. And they 
don't see the world for the way it is because of what they believe. And there are many examples, probably the best example, I've written a number of books on Hitler, and World War II was really about inferior races. And we see that as silly. We see that as, come on, there are differences in people, but there's no inferior race. They really saw the Jews, the Slavics, and a lot of other groups as inferior. They had no qualms about killing hundreds of millions of people because they really thought they were inferior and they were trying to produce a superior race, in spite of all the evidence. So how did the most intelligent nation in the world, the most educated nation in the world, kill several hundred million people based on racism? Well, they did. They were blinded. They didn't see what is, I would hope to all of you, part of the church is obvious, that we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, we're all equal, end of story. There is no inferior race, it's not true. So, and you, you see that, it's pretty logical. And if I said, oh, the Slavic, it's an inferior people, they're an inferior race, you'd probably look at me and say, are you okay? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Okay. Question here. From a, a creationist uh, point of view, how do you defend against um, the topic of like uh, vestigial, uh, traits in animals and humans? Well, very simply, I have a whole book on that. In fact, I have several books. All of the claimed vestigial organs are not vestigial. They all have a function. All have a very important function. There used to be over 100 vestigial organs, the appendix, the tonsils, the oscoxics, on down the line. And now we know all of those have important functions. There are no vestigial organs. Evolution was wrong. You need your tonsils. You ought to try to keep them if you can. You need your wisdom teeth. Keep them if you can. Now they get infected, you may have to have them removed. But on the other hand, they're all useful. Okay, other questions? Um, I've heard that the people have gone through and tried to figure out what the mathematical possibility of evolution is, and they've come up with the answer that basically evolution, if you combine all the factors that would have to be perfect for it to happen, is actually mathematically impossible. And what you were talking about is one part, I think, that would go into that. But then there's a whole range of other problems with it where something has to be just perfect so that no matter how far back they keep going and how many years they add, basically ma evolution will never be possible, even just yeah. mathematically. That's true. You can do that. But the point is there are two choices. Either God created us or evolution created us. If you reject God created us, or, you know, if you reject God created us, what's the other choice? And so the, uh, that's why 95% of all scientists are evolutionists and atheists. Because they don't see any other choice. They say, yeah, I recognize that problem, but we're here. That's fact. Ha explain it. Well, God, not that explanation. I don't want that explanation. I want a naturalistic explanation. And therefore, yeah, all the, they recognize all this. I'm sure what I'm saying isn't new to any evolutionist. But what other choice do you have? They cannot accept the other choice. And that's partially because our society pushes one worldview. And I was very careful when I taught at the universities, very, very careful. But if I was too open with some of this stuff, I would have been out because they cannot, they will not tolerate. And even where I was at, I had people look at me and say, what's wrong with you? How can you deny the fact of evolution? But we got this for, yeah, I, I know we got lots of problems, but evolution is fact. Accept it. What's wrong with you? We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, abiogenesis. We'll figure it out, the source of genetic variation. We'll figure it out. Hey, look, it's only been 150 years since Darwin did his great work. Just give us time. We'll figure it out. And that, as many people say, I don't have enough faith to be an evolutionist. And that, in many Other ways, is true. questions out here? If, you might just, if a few, spend a few sentences. I mean, you, you used to be an atheist. You used to believe in evolution. Why did you change? Once you study God's creation, you realize that there has to be a creator. There's no way. The example I gave before was uh, egg shells. Simple, righteous molecules of shell, no problem. Egg shells are really complex. And the problem that evolution has is we can't go from water to land without eggs. And therefore, egg shells are evolution are critical, but shells preserve pretty well in the fossil record. So where's evidence of their evolution? How could they evolve? Because they're not going to work until they have all the parts. And again, they'll say, well, we're still working on it. We're still trying to figure this out. 
So eggshells are complex, not to even mention the complexity of the egg. It's enormously complex. We take it for granted, we crack it open and make egg salad, but it's very complex. Do you have any association with Frank Turek? I, I know him, yeah. He's the one I have, don't have enough faith to be, believe in ev evolution. Yeah, that's true. The problem is we need to have more influence in the world, and the problem is we don't have it because the college I taught at had Christmas parties for 25 years. Everybody loved them, even the atheists, no problem. And the lawyers came along and said, you can't have a Christmas party because separation of church and state, so they stopped the Christmas parties, and nobody really, including the atheists, nobody has been happy. So the government has been very aggressive in trying to remove every vestigial part of religion. And that's tragic. We have a government that's very hostile toward the religious worldview. We need to court cases to, you know, this stuff I'm talking about is not a church. I'm in a church, but this my presentation was not a church. But the courts have ruled this presentation is a church because it opposes evolution. And therefore, it brings you to the God belief. Therefore, this presentation is a church. Therefore, it's unconstitutional. And that's quite a gap between a presentation and a, a church in the state. OK, I don't see any more hands. So I'll one more hand, one more question, and then we'll uh, wrap up the Q&A. So I didn't quite uh, understand how you became a Christian or a non-evolutionist. Studied, studied God's world. There are two, two ways to God. One is through his word, another is through his works. And I have a whole book out there about scientists who were atheists and became Christians as a result of studying God's world. When you study God's creation, you realize that it could not have evolved. It must have been created and therefore you, 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 you deny reality. And so often we study God by studying his word. And churches really ignore, I think, maybe this church, because we have this meeting here. But churches, ministers really ignore studying God's creation. And in 200 years ago, you go to seminary. You had courses in hermeneutics. You had courses in eschatology. You had courses in etc. And you had botany. To be a pastor, you had to study botany and zoology and mathematics. That was part of the curriculum. And then when you gave sermons, you, you know, covered the book of Luke. And then next week, we're covering botany. We're going to talk about plants and how God created plants. I think the mentions the, in the Bible, it mentions animals like 186 times and mentions plants about that many times. How can you understand the Bible without understanding plants and animals. You can't. And so therefore, we just kind of go over them. And we don't really understand the scripture because we don't understand the plant they're referring to. Now, some commentaries will have an asterisk there, and there will be a plant mention, and it will mention what the plant does. But really, we need to, I think, cover science. But how many pastors nowadays are trained to cover science? How many pastors have had several years of understanding, studying botany, zoology, anatomy, etc. Not many do. That's why they call people like me in because I spent my life studying science and therefore I can present the side that pastors can't present. But so many pastors, not here I understand, but so many pastors, they're stuck on the Bible, the word, that's fine, but there's God's works and the Bible talks a lot about God's works. So they should mention, be mentioned occasionally, at least. Have people like Heinz come in and bring some speakers in. But you cannot study God's works without appreciating the creator. I cannot learn about Mozart without listening to his music. I cannot learn about an artist without studying his paintings and his work. We learn about artists through their works. We learn about God through his works, and his works is the creation. Okay, let's give them a hand for the presentation. And uh, just to add to what um, 
uh, Jerry was saying, I, I've mentioned this before, but many of, the, many of the speakers we bring in, actually they used to believe in evolution and when they studied you know, nature, uh, the design in that, there's no way to explain it. And even though they, it's obvious that evolution doesn't work, they just refuse to accept creation because that would mean I'd have to be responsible to that. So, um, yeah, Jerry, you mentioned a very good point. Uh, mm -hmm. The longer you are married, the longer you're going to live. Yep. But I've been married for a very long time, and I expect to live. For very yeah. long. Well, thank yeah. you for thank you for that encouragement. <laughs> yeah. 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 So let me close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We just thank you for Jerry's uh, ministry among us here. We thank you for the. Uh, all the information that you give him, Lord, that show the truth of your word. And that we, as we study nature, we see that it uh, confirms and verifies the truth of your word. And we thank you for that. And that Jerry makes that uh, uh, visible to us. And we just thank you for all the resources you pr provide for that to give us more uh, understanding of that. I just thank you for each one here. Pray that each one would have learned much from it and be able to share what they have learned with others they come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions about my books, let me know. One question people have is why I have a book on Eisenhower. World War II was the conflict between creation and evolution. and cre It really was. And creation won. And if creation would have lost, all of you would be speaking German now. Ken Z. Deutzbrecken, nine? Nine, yeah, 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 sehr good, that's sehr good.